launching America's Entrepreneur. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Aaron Spatz, and each week we interview entrepreneurs, industry experts, and other high achievers as they detail their personal and professional journeys. Before we jump in, hit the subscribe button and be sure to hit the bell icon so you're notified every time we release a new episode. Welcome to America's Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining me for yet another week, and I'm, I'm excited to welcome just such a wide variety of guests, and that's one of my favorite things about this show is just getting to really get into the weeds and to interview folks, to hear their stories, to hear their accomplishments, to hear their challenges and their, their growth opportunities, and, and really in, in hopes that's going to inspire you. It's going to help uh, give you ideas and, and things to consider as you go through your own professional journey. And so with that, I'm super excited to welcome William Toady to the program today. Uh, William is a U.S. Navy career submarine guy. He's the, he did 26 years in our U.S. Navy. Incredibly grateful to him for his service. Uh, he he had the distinct privilege of being a commanding officer uh, for FESTAC uh, nuclear submarine USS Indianapolis. Um, beyond that, though, he was able to he, he was able to go even further than that and uh, end up com commanding a submarine squadron. And so, for those that are unfamiliar uh, with naval terminology, um, I'm sure someone will correct me later. But uh, but he was he was Commodore, which means he was he was directly responsible for a squadron. In this case, it was six uh, nuclear fast attack submarines. And so um, following his time in the Navy after he retired, then he went on to work in a, in a number of corporations. Uh, a lot of them were tied to the to the defense industry uh, before he ultimately retired. And now he has come out with a book uh, from CO to CEO. You got it right here. Uh, just released. I would encourage you to go grab a copy of it. I'll have a link for you um, to his publisher where you can where you can go grab a copy. Uh, but incredibly excited for him in in his book, and I'd encourage you to go check it out. So, Bill, I just want to welcome you, man. Thank you so much for making some time for me. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate it. Awesome. Glad to be here. Awesome. Yeah, I'm 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 excited. I'm excited to chat with you. You've got a really really fascinating career. It's one that I think a lot of people can connect with. I mean, we've, there's, there's a lot of folks that either listen or watch this, but also, I mean, I, I'm connected to a number of career military folks myself, and you have a very unique perspective because you've been there, done that you, you had a successful military career. You've had a successful post-military career, um, you know, in, in the world of business, and now you've published a book. And so, um, I, I mean, I think the best place to start, honestly, let's, I mean, let's, let's maybe fast rewind, but go back to, Maybe your decision to get out and that that initial transition and in, in, into what your into what your first role in business looked like. Yeah. So, Aaron, it was really um, kind of you'll do a lot of soul searching when you decide to, to make a transition after you spend so much time, you know, in the Navy. My case went to the Naval Academy and 26 years. And you, you, as you know, with the Marine Corps and the Navy, you really come to love the service. And so. The decision on getting out wasn't an easy one, but it, it occurred to me that if I wanted to have a viable second career and not just a few years working in industry, um, I needed to get out young enough that whatever company I went to work for would be willing to invest in me. So, and then that, you know, there are companies not allowed to talk about age when you transition. Yeah. If you talk about instead as a runway, how much time do you have ahead of you? Not how much time has passed, but how much time do you have ahead of you to work for them? Because if they're going to invest in you, they're going to want to know that they have some reasonable chance of getting return on that investment. So if you get out a few years away from retirement age, right, your mandatory retirement age for some companies, and they realize they're not going to get a lot out of you, then they're not going to put a lot into you. Yeah. And so I decided mid-40s was the latest I could make that transition and still have a viable 20 year second career. And so that's why I made the decision to get out when I did. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I actually remember that part, um, uh, in your book. I'm, I'm going to shamelessly pl plug your book in a few places. I promise for those that are watching, listening, I, I, I won't overdo it. I won't be that obnoxious about it, but, uh, but I, I would encourage you to grab a copy of Bill's book because there's, he goes a number of different directions and covers a lot of ground, and a lot of places in this, but yeah, Bill, I mean, you, uh, you, you covered that. And I think it's the, uh, 
kind of like what you said. I mean, it, in the book, you refer to it as, as runway, but it's the it's the idea that while a company can't just straight up tell you like, hey, you're too old, we don't want you there. The other way to think about it is, yeah, how much how much you know, how many years of useful service do you have? Do we have? But like beyond kind of what you refer to as like you, you they've got to get on ramp, right? They there's training, there's investment, there's you know, they're just getting to know the company right before then before you then you be start to become an impact player if they if like as you mentioned like identified you for like key leadership roles and stuff like that then they want to enjoy that part of you too right as they don't want right. to just get you to that point and then you peace out like mm -hmm. we want to be able to enjoy the fruits of of their investment too and so that's uh that's something really i think for a lot of folks to consider because um the for the longer you wait i think the more difficult that becomes and you've got to really you got to really be able to sell really, really well. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, you know, Aaron, I, I knew that I, <clears throat> I would need to learn a lot in the post military career in industry. I knew that there was a lot I didn't know. I had no idea really though, how little I really did know. And, and the lessons started piling up over the years and it didn't help that my transition class that the Navy gave me and Marine Corps gave you, as you were leaving service um, was almost entirely wrong, right? So transitioning to industry is a stressful enough condition as it is. But when the military actively tells you things that are absolutely 100% wrong and start you heading down the wrong path, that makes that stress level go up even further. And so, you know, I, I thought maybe I was an outlier that, that maybe I had just a bad experience, but as I, you know, tra transitioned industry and saw more and more and more veterans transition industry, making the same mistakes I had made when I got out, I realized that I was not an outlier, that there's, there's active stupidity going on here with how the military prepares you to make the transition industry. And after a decade or so, I decided I needed to do something about it. And that's really what led to me writing the book. That's, that's really awesome. Yeah. I mean, there's so many lessons that a lot of us have to learn. And unfortunately, a lot of us learn them the hard way. Right. And it's, it's some of it, I think is completely avoidable. I think some of it's also just that personal development journey that, that we all go through. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've talked with a lot of folks about this. I'd actually be genuinely curious about your perspective on this because, you know, and especially for you, right? I mean, you, you had a full blown career, very successful. And, but, but you were known, right. You were known as the CEO, right? At, right. At the, at the, at the peak of your career. And so, but then you're getting out, right. You've got, you know, couple, couple decades and a half worth of knowledge. You've got, I mean, I can't imagine all the things that you've seen and gotten to participate in, but you, you know, the system, We've obviously got our, you know, our chain, the chain of command structure, the organization structure, our, you know, our, the, the whole command and control structure set up, but then you, you leave that and you, you know, that's what you've known, right? You're very comfortable with that. You've, you've grown through those ranks and that culture. How then was it for you though? Like, I mean, you, you've worked in a number of organizations since you, since you retired, but what was mentally affecting you in that, in those moments? Like what, what were you? What were you considering when it's like, okay, like I'm no longer the CEO, right? Now I am, you know, a VP or now I'm this or that. What's going on? What's going on inside of you during during that time? Yeah. So it's truth is the more successful you are on active duty, the more trouble you could find yourself in when you transition to industry. And there's a wonderful book that I did not write called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And the premise of the book is um, when you're successful in one phase, you're going to try to think that those behaviors that resulted in that success can carry, can translate, carry through into success in other domains. True. And it turns out not to be true. Not only is it not true, but it's dangerous thinking that because I was a good, I hope I was a good CEO. But if I was a good CEO, using those same kind of behaviors will allow me to be a good industry leader. It turns out um, not to be the case. And I call 
Uh, one thing I was told when I was transitioning was that all your civilian company will, will want from you is, is good leadership. And I, I end up calling that the great lie yeah, because it's not that. true, right? Yeah. Good leadership by itself doesn't get you anywhere, not even in the military. And I use the analogy just because you're a great leader, Air Force wing commander, let's say, does good leadership allow you to be able to command a submarine in battle? Of course not. You actually need to know something about the situation you're going to be in. We call it tactics, techniques, and procedures in the military. But there's an equivalent to TTP in industry. And until you know that, you're basically starting from scratch and believing that you can, you're going to be accelerated because of your, you know, your skills on active duty can do more than hurt. I mean, they could actually set you back significantly. And I saw so many people crash and burn because they thought that they could use the same skills they used on active duty in industry. And they, they were absolutely counterproductive. Yeah. And that's one of the lessons I try to convey in the book. Yeah, no, I mean, it for me, it came really uh, loud and clear. I mean, you, you cover it early on um, in the book and, you know, that one thing and you know, talking about your um, informed passion to learn and I'll, I'll quit teasing the book because now I think everyone needs to go buy it. But the, you know, but that informed passion to learn, I really, really enjoyed that segment um, because you, just like you said a second ago, it's like we get told leadership, right? And I, I do, I think that's important. Like, I think it's, imp I think we, there's so much that we learn in terms of leadership principles, leadership traits, mm -hmm. and just general uh, mission accomplishment, troop welfare, just all, all the buzzwords that I haven't used in forever. Uh, but, but all these different things in terms of getting, getting the job done and doing it, doing it in a great way and getting, you know, getting your troops, getting your sailors to, you know, to follow you and, and to serve them and to do what we need to do to, to come home safely. Right. And, mm -hmm. That's the obvious, but then I love how you you went to the informed passion to learn because it what you're what you're showing and you do a like phenomenal job. I I thought articulating this here is it it's like the company where somebody thinks that just because they are in charge of the company doesn't that they don't really need to know what's going on like in detail. Mm -hmm. It's and I, I disagree with that. And I obvious, it's obvious right. that you, that you do as well. Right. And so it's like, I think having that, what informed passion to learn, but like that intellectual curiosity, maybe like a, another way of thinking about it too. Right. It's like just mm -hmm. have, having a, having a, having a desire to learn something more. Right. And to push yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the informed part, it, what that means is don't forget what you learned in the military. You need to be informed. That's what differentiates you from somebody coming out of college. Yeah. Passion, you know, as, as, as you would say in the Marine Corps, you learned how to drive through the suck, right? Right. That, and you got your passion carried you through the suck. Um, and that's an absolutely vital skill in industry is that passion. But to learn, you are not going to know 10% when you transition to industry what you need to know to succeed. And so you need to demonstrate the ability to learn. And your future employer will be looking. And it doesn't matter if you go into, you know, venture capital or you go into a defense company or I worked at Hewlett Packard, which was one of my favorite jobs, actually a commercial company um, for a few years. And it doesn't matter where you go. You know, they're going to be there. They know that you're going to need to learn a lot yeah. in order to succeed in industry and, or whether you, start your own company as an entrepreneur, right? You need to learn. And so inform, passion, learn together. That turns out to be the one thing that, that I needed to demonstrate, not good leadership. Of course you need good leadership, but inform, passion, learn, I think more properly characterizes what your a company will be looking from you when you do that transition. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely love that. And I, uh, I appreciate appreciate the way that you uh, the way that you articulated that and and shared that because I think that's uh, I th I think it's really well really well stated. So um, go you know, so like moving moving on through your career, right? So let's talk a little bit about the various various roles that you held in the different organizations. I mean, you were at the VP level, president, and CEO level. Mm -hmm. and so like for you, like looking back on it 
and it, this, this doesn't have to be necessarily like advice for military folks. It can, but thinking maybe a little bit more broad, like what, what do you feel like really helped you the most in terms of being able to, I, I guess this is kind of a military esque question, but like being able to assimilate into the, you know, a civilian work culture, mm -hmm. but then also at the same time, being able to, you know, advance your career and like you, you're able to, you're able to move and, and move your way through organizations. So like, what, what do you attribute that to? Yeah. So I really, every, every job I had in industry was a stepping stone. Um, and I learned so much that informed passion alert. I learned so much. And when I first transitioned, my philosophy was I'm a, I'm an ensign all over again. I'm not a captain. <laughs> I'm an ensign all over again in this new environment. Yeah. And I started out in a defense company that was that had fantastic process and decided, OK, they, they basically took the approach that I, I knew nothing, which was closer to the truth. than I wanted to admit. And so they said, we're going to we think you, we could train you as a leader, a, a business leader. But we got to start from the basics, the fundamentals. So how do you execute a program in a disciplined fashion? You know, how do you manage finances, payroll? How do you manage an employee population? I say, and in the book, I say something I'm always telling my, my military friends. Leadership is hard, but it's harder when you're leading people who can actually quit. Right. right. And so, you know, how do you manage a civilian population of employees? And, and ways to get them on board with whatever vision you're trying to bring. And so that was a wonderful place to grow up in industry. I learned, you know, they sent me to SMU near you nice. um, yeah. for finance school. And wow. so, um, you know, starting there. And so that was, and then my next job, I was recruited to run networks. And as, as I mentioned in Hewlett Packard, I, to run all the unclassified Navy networks. Okay. So I joined a civilian company that had no a commercial company, I should say, that had no background in DOD. And I became kind of the senior guy in the defense world for a hundred and ten billion dollar a year revenue, um, you know, commercial company. So I got to learn all these wonderful commercial methods, techniques, right? Yeah. How the, the difference in commercial manufacturing as opposed to defense manufacturing that I come from. The services business, because we did a lot of IT services for the Department of Defense and then later the UK, MOD, and places like that. And so that was a huge learning experience. And from there, I took my got my first president job of a much smaller company, obviously, but PL, you know, president level PL, working sure. with a board of directors and learning how to deal with that. So in every step, um, you know, it was a new experience, a new learning experience, you know, until I finally ended up as CEO and, uh, you know, went from near just under two billion dollars of P&L to my CEO job was much smaller. And it was for a private equity firm. And private equity firms like to restructure. So we took a eight hundred million dollar ish business and restructured it into a two hundred ish, two hundred million ish business. But um, in every case, there's something new to learn. And if you ever think you've done learning, it's probably time for you to retire because you never really do stop learning. That's so that's, that's so true. I mean, we're, we're always growing, we're always learning. And if you're not, you really need to be concerned. <laughs> right. You know, it's always, always, always trying to challenge ourselves and learn and grow. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's really awesome. I mean, you had a had a variety of different experiences. I mean, like what for you, and once again, I know you capture a lot of this in the book, but in terms of like lessons learned, you know, biggest, biggest business challenges that you faced that you'd like, man, I, I don't really know what the right answer is here. Like, how do I, you know, how do I overcome this challenge? Like what, what, what's an example of something that you, that you had to overcome as you know, as a senior executive leader in a in a company, and you're maybe you didn't initially know what to do, and you, mm -hmm. and but you eventually figured it out. Like, is there anything that kind of comes to mind? Yeah, I would say that you know, pu publicly traded companies. I talk about this bit in the book, and I'm going to segue into something that I don't talk about in the book. 
Okay, great. Publicly traded companies like top line growth, right? Because that attracts shareholders. And I do explain to, to military folks who won't know this, why that's the case. And so when you're working at a publicly traded company, there's constant pressure for quarterly returns, you know, quarterly growth, right? And quarterly reports, earnings statements and all of that. And so um, what that can drive to some unhealthy behaviors. In some cases, you'll do um, things you shouldn't do, like trade off EBITDA or profit for, 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 for revenue sure. to attract shareholders. And there's a lot of uh, call unhealthy pressure. And one of the things I need to learn how to do was resist. How far do you go to push back on the pressure to grow? Um, and in the, the, in the, I will say before I transition to the bit I didn't talk about in the book, that that was one of the very liberating things about working for a private equity company, where you don't have to worry about earning statements, quarterly earning statements, and you don't have to worry about attracting shareholders. The PE company told me, I was CEO uh, for a company that was owned by a private equity firm. The PE company always said, Bill, run this company as if you owned it, right? Do the right thing. And that was so wow. um, liberating. And I will say, though, that I got lucky with my PE owners. There are other... <laughs> I've heard horror stories yeah. about PE companies that sure. <laughs> run about like their personal fiefdom, right? Right. Mine didn't do that. And it was just basically, cool. they were interested in long-term value, not quarterly returns. Yeah. And so that was wonderful. But there's a couple of mini series that we used to call mini series. Now they're called limited series out right now. And one is called We Crash and the other one's called The Dropout. We Crash is about we work. Okay. You know, it was a new startup that uh, grew way faster than they had cash to support. And that was a train wreck, right? And so the We Crash is a, I would say it's a moral story about, you know, people that didn't understand that cash is king. And, and they couldn't basically, towards the end, they were growing so fast they couldn't make payroll anymore. And they ended up crashing. And then the dropout is about uh, Theranos, right? And and that that is a, another lesson, right? A leadership lesson or business lesson about, you know, the math has to work. The science has to work. And if the science doesn't work, it's fantasy. And so, you know, if you have a great idea, but if you don't get the chemistry right and the physics right, that great idea is going to fall apart. And, and I really do. I wish those docu docu not documentaries, they're limited series. I wish they'd come out, you know, when before I'd written the book because I would have incorporated it because I saw those in spades. Wow. In, in my, my businesses over the years as well. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I just, I just made a couple, a couple of notes. So I'm like, okay, I need, I need to go check those out. So, yeah. uh, I'll, I see that they're uh... they're meant, by the way, as business lessons for business people. But if you watch them right, you take away the right lessons, and that's really important. Yeah, no, it's cool. Yeah, it looks like one of them's on uh, Apple TV Plus. The other one looks yeah, like I think TV we could... crash and Theranos. I think might be on Hulu. Yep, right? that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. So I note to self. <laughs> so that's yeah. awesome. They're worth a look. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So. Well, awesome. So, I mean, you know, we, we always love to cover challenges. I, I always love to hear people's challenges and how, and how they overcame them. But I also, I think we, I think we owe it to you. I think we owe it to everybody. Like, like what are some wins? Like what, what are some of your biggest proudest moments in business that you, you'd look back on as like, man, that was, that was something that like, I look back on that. I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of that. Well, one that's topical today is one of my businesses, we were, um, we, we had a, a United States contract that was actually funded by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, or DITRA for short, to improve border security in Ukraine. And so I made several, I had Ukrainian employees. I had several, I uh, made several trips to Ukraine, actually met with President Poroshenko wow. um, 2016. And, um, and boy, the boy's that in the news now, right? Yeah. And I only wish we had been 
uh, more effective. And I would say that the political will in the United States, in Congress in particular, was, was declining over the issue of corruption in Ukraine. Um, and there was this there was a sense in 2016 that the Russians weren't really a threat. And as we were you know, funneling money into improving Ukrainian border security, there was worry in Congress that a lot of that money was going into the pockets of Ukrainian officials, right? And so I, I tried arguing in Congress, I guess this isn't a success story with staffers and with members that, you know, what's worse, corruption or having Russia take over the country. And yeah. um, we did not succeed. The, the program shut down. And um, sadly, right, um, because I made yeah. trips to Moscow as well, um, wow. trying to get the sense of that. And so I, I guess the point is that sometimes you're doing work that's actually more important than you realize at the time. Yeah. And here we are in 2022, wishing, I wish that I was more effective in 2016 in getting these programs secured. Yeah. Um, so that was one that comes to mind. I would say as well that in, in the early days of my industry career, in the 2006 timeframe, my business was about putting FLIRs on predator drones, oh, wow. 2006, that were flying very important missions in Afghanistan and Iraq. And watching my workforce, um, they didn't know exactly what these drones were doing, Predator UAVs, but they knew whatever it was, it was really important. And the, this is one of my really proud moments where I realized these people are just as patriotic as everybody I worked with in, in uniform. Um, they just have a different job to do. The yeah. job is no less important because whether you're building ships or airplanes or tanks or whatever, you know, without those, um, our fighting forces are much less effective. And so that was a really, that was a, an epiphany, right? A light bulb moment for me to see these people uh, building these systems, knowing how important they were and knowing that they were saving lives, um, that I realized that even though I'm not in uniform anymore, the mission we're doing is, very, very important. And, and I think that was probably a great moment. That's awesome. And then when I was CEO, my workforce was so happy with the vision, I think that we were able to create. We It was a turnaround. Um, okay. Uh, you know, and everybody sooner or later is going to have to deal with the turnaround. And we absolutely had a turnaround. We had a, we had a business that was, that was uh, siphoning money off. It was, was, perhaps not long for this world if we didn't fix it structurally and it required a lot of focus on finances but as well focus on the mission and we're able to do that as well the company is called spartan wow just left them in december and that was really heartwarming to to, to get the um, workforce excited about what they were doing again and, and get the company whole so that they had a future they could survive and actually we ended up getting them sold to a much more stable um, owner. So that was a wonderful thing as well. Yeah. Well, those are, I mean, three really interesting, really different highlights, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I can only imagine going back to 2016 and thinking, you know, you know, maybe the general public, I, I, I'm just, I'm thinking as an everyday American, I don't think Ukraine was even on my radar of, of thinking about the possibility of any type of Russian invasion or anything like that. And so, um, so if, and, and I was doing a lot of business travel back then, not to, mm -hmm. not, not to Ukraine, but I can imagine if I was going to Ukraine or to Moscow, war was the last thing I'd be thinking about, to be honest. And mm -hmm. so it's just crazy to think that just, you know, six short years later, right. And yeah. uh, how I wonder what's changed. happened to my Ukrainian employees. I, after yeah. the contract was terminated, we, I lost touch with them and yeah, I have no idea if they're living or dead or, you yeah. know, just, it's such a wonderful country full of wonderful people. And I think people understand with, with the current president in particular that, um, you know, whatever government issues they had. In fact, I remember one conversation I had with President Poroshenko where I tried to raise the issue of corruption. And he says, the Russians have a gun to my head. I wish I could, I had time to deal with 
the things that your Congress think are important. <laughs> wow. And I thought, well, maybe that's a little exaggeration. In 2016, I thought that's what, that's what I was thinking. 2022, was he exaggerating? No, he wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. There's, uh, we could, I know we're not, this isn't necessarily a, uh, national it, security program. N- yeah. No. And we, you know, we could sit here and like provide color commentary to the invasion and to, you know, the geopolitical factors and mm. intelligence community stuff. And we could talk about a lot of that, but, um, yeah, it, it is. It's, it's very, it's very fascinating. Fascinating to see where that's come. And I, I, I like your other two examples, you know, like people taking pride in their work, even though they're not, I mean, I have the uniform on, but being an, an offense contractor that's providing critical, uh, you know, critical tooling, critical resourcing to theater and taking pride in their work, working long hours, doing what they need to do to make it happen. I mean, that's, right. that's, that's really awesome. And then your last example of, you know, turning around an organization, getting them stable, getting it sold into a, into a more stable organization and, helping reinstill pride and, and, you know, all sorts of other, you know, a lot of intangible things mm-hmm. that, that come with that. You know, so that's, I mean, those are, those are some worthy things to uh, be proud of, you know, so it's, it, it's, it, it's really cool. Um, I'm going to plug your book one more time. So I would, I would uh, highly encourage you guys just released fresh off the press. Um, I would encourage you to jump on and you can find this about anywhere. When I was on Simon and Schuster's website, They've got links to you could pick it up pretty much everywhere. Amazon, yeah, Amazon, yeah books Barnes and Noble, Noble Barnes yep, and Noble, all, all those, those places. places. Yep. Usual so suspects. Yeah. So if you uh, if you search for it on if you just Google it from CEO to CEO, it'll take you to the Simon and Schuster page. You can uh, you, know, you can go grab it wherever wherever suits you. So, but um, Bill, really really appreciate you taking time to be with me. Thanks. Thank you for sharing sharing your story and um you know really just a true pleasure really uh you know love how you've articulated elements of your career i love how you know you're not just assuming because you had a you know very successful military career that that automatically translates into overwhelming success the very next day in in your civilian career and so i I love the way you approach that topic i think it's a unfortunately i think it's a big misconception that um, that needs to be corrected. And I think you do a really awesome job addressing that in the book. So, um, thank you once again for, uh, for sharing your time with me. I appreciate it. Man. Take care. Thanks. Thanks for listening to America's entrepreneur. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review or comment on your preferred social media platform, share it out with friends, family, coworkers, others in your network. And of course, you can write me directly at Aaron at boldmedia.us. That's A-A-R-O-N at boldmedia.us. Till next time.